Thanks, Kelly. Praise the Lord. Good to see everybody. Good, everybody back from vacation, and we're back from vacation, and so we're all rested, ready to shout a little bit today. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Let's stand. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. Lord, as we come in your name, Lord God, we gather together for this is the day the Lord has made. You have ordained this day. God, you have ordered this day. And I pray today in the name of the Lord, God, that you be with us in this house. God, let us be sensitive to your Holy Ghost, to your direction today, O oh God. Let us be led of your spirit. Let the anointing of God be upon us, O oh Lord, as we seek your face. And Lord, you do your work in this house. God, as we present ourselves and we come vessels unto you, Lord, fill us again with the power of the Holy Ghost. Fill us again and refresh us, O oh God, in your presence, God, we pray. And we'll give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let's clap our hands to the Lord, everybody. God, we thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Sunday school teacher was teaching her class and, and was trying to get the point across about Thanksgiving, being thankful. And so she started going around the, around the room and she started asking the students and saying, what, what are you thankful for? And of course, one little boy said, I'm thankful for my, for my new skateboard I got for my birthday. And one little girl said she was thankful for the new dress that she had and so on. And they, they kept going out around the room and each, each little kid had something that they were thankful for. And she got to one little boy and she said, Tommy, what are you thankful for? And he said, I'm thankful for my glasses. And she thought that was kind of unusual because most kids don't like glasses. And she said, okay, Tommy, well, why are you thankful for your glasses? He said, well, he said, when I wear glasses, the boys won't beat me up and the girls won't kiss me. So he, you can always find something to be thankful for, right? Amen. All right, I want to go to the word of the Lord today, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians, the fourth chapter. And I want to start reading at, at verse 4 of chapter 4. And as I was studying at this for today, and, and I read these scriptures, and realizing that when Paul wrote the book of Philippians, uh, Paul wrote that book from a prison cell. This is one of the prison letters uh, that Paul wrote. So that kind of takes on and gives gives new meaning when you when you read the book of Philippians, and you realize that Paul is literally under guard in a prison. Not, not sitting at a desk at his home or, 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 or somewhere in a church office or something like that, uh, writing this letter to the church. Paul is in prison. And, and Paul is probably, uh, I don't know at what point this was in Paul's life, but we know, of course, that Paul was martyred for the faith. But Paul was facing not the best of circumstances when Paul wrote these words. And, and he, he wrote this uh, letter. Of course, he, he, Paul started the church at Philippi. He, he uh, preached the gospel first at Philippi. So this is a very special book to him. Most of the churches he wrote to, Paul started in one way or another. And, and so... We read verse 4 of Philippians chapter 4. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. Now he says that sitting in a prison. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now that's not the first time Paul said that. If you look back to chapter 3 and verse 1, and which the guys don't have that and don't worry about going there. But Paul starts chapter 3 and verse 1 by saying, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. 
And so Paul is emphasizing, and it's a major theme throughout the book of Philippians, the joy of the Lord and the peace of God. And so Paul is emphasizing this again, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Him, him repeating that is kind of like when I'm up preaching and I get to a point in my message and I want to, I feel the need to emphasize my message so my voice may get a little louder and I may get a little more dramatic or emphatic when I'm trying to stress a point in a message, Paul repeating that is the same thing. So Paul was really trying to drive home a point. He, he's really wanting the church to understand something about this. And, and, and he goes on, verse 5, and, and we're going to read several verses here. Let your moderation, moderation is gentleness, kindness. Kindness, well we need that taught in this generation, don't we? That's, that's another lesson, but... Let your, let your moderation or your kindness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. It's interesting that Paul associates the presence of God with kindness. The kindness that we display. Again, that's another lesson, but I, I find that very interesting. Verse 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Well, that's a scripture we need to live every day. The, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, and now that now at the last, now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. Wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do, and we, we all know this scripture, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can do all things through Christ. Paul, Paul said, I, I, know how, I know how to have and I know how to be without, but I can do all things. I, I know how to be hungry, I know how to be satisfied, but I can do all things through Christ. I want to speak to you the next few minutes on the secret of peace. Don't know that it's quite the secret, but sounds like a good title. The secret of peace. Paul was, uh, in his ministry, Paul was so full of zeal, so, so full of passion, so... So, so full of desire to fulfill the will of God in his life, so full of the Holy Ghost that Paul was traveling from city to city and establishing the churches. He was going from place to place, preaching the message of Jesus, preaching the gospel, and there was one point, and it was recorded in Acts chapter 16, that Paul had a vision, a man from Macedonia uh, came to him in a vision and said, said, we need you to come to us. Paul had a vision. There was a man who was, he was hungry for truth. He was <coughs> hungry for the gospel. He was hungry for the message of Jesus. And he, he said, I want, you, I, want you to, I want you to come to us and come help us. And, and God was revealing the will of God to, to Paul. And, and so Paul set out on a journey on his way to Macedonia. And, and in the process comes to the city of Philippi. 
and as Paul is in the city of Philippi. And you know, oftentimes when we know we're in the will of God, and we know that God has spoken to us, often we feel like because we know we're in the will of God, everything's going to pretty much go smooth as we being in the will of God. We, we kind of get the idea that since we're in the will of God, that, that everything's going to work out the way we want it to, that everything is going to happen uh, easy, it's going to come, God's going to work it out, I'm not going to have to worry about too much. Folks, that is not the case. Now, i got to tell you, being in ministry, uh, many years I've been in ministry and pastoring uh, here for many years, I, I can tell you there are many, there are many mountains, mountaintops, and there's many times of great joy that you begin to see and, and God allows you to see the vision that he's placed in your heart and, and you start to see that fulfilled and those are awesome times. But let me tell you something, uh, and, and knowing you're in the will of God, that's, that's even better, but there are times that when you are in the will of God that everything does not always go that way. That doesn't mean you're out of the will of God. That doesn't mean that, that God has left you or God has forgotten about you or God, is, God has moved on and you just haven't heard from God yet. That, that doesn't mean that at all. There are times in the will of God that things happen, that uh, obstacles come up, and, and Philippi was one of those places. He was in the will of God. He was doing the will of God, <coughs> following what God had, had asked him to do and and, and the command, following the command of what he felt was God's will for his life, but he encountered obstacle after obstacle. He, there, there were things that came up in the will of God. Now, I, I, would imagine, I would imagine that as Paul is facing these things, that, that Paul knew that God, he had heard from God. Paul, Paul knew that, that God had spoken to him, and and he had faith in, in understanding and feeling that God had, had uh, directed his life and brought him to this point of where he was in his ministry, even though there were things that were hindering what he was trying to do. And there were great things that happened in, in, when, when he got there. There were, there were uh, things that happened. Lydia was converted. Uh, they, were, they, they were down by the sea and they were praying and, and uh, the ladies heard them praying and, and Lydia came over and began to inquire because Lydia was a worshiper of God, the Bible says. And, and so she came over and, and, and Lydia was, was converted and Paul cast the demon out of a, out of a slave girl while he was at, uh, at Philippi. So there were great things that happened, but because of the things that happened, we find that Paul and Silas were severely beaten. They were severely beaten. They were thrown in jail. They did not have the benefit of a trial. They didn't have the benefit of, of, of being able to defend themselves. And of course, we, we know the story. It's a common story. You've heard it preached many times from, from this pulpit. Uh, at the midnight hour after they had been cast into prison, into jail, they, they were sitting there, shackles on their hands, shackles on their feet. They had been beaten, their backs bloody and bruised, leaning back against that damp old rough rock wall that, that was the prison. And, and they, they had been thrown in there and they're sitting there in that prison cell. What would you be doing sitting in a prison cell? What, what, what would your response be to, to being in the will of God, doing the will of God, doing what God called you to do, preaching the gospel, people's lives being touched and changed because uh, of the min your ministry, and you end up finding yourself arrested and beaten and thrown into prison? What would your response be in that prison cell? I'll tell you what some of us would do. Number one, some of us would second guess whether we'd heard from God or not. We'd say, oh, Lord, I must have missed it on this one. I, 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 I was sure I heard from you, God. 
This can't be the will of God for me to be in this prison. This can't be the will of God for me to be going through this. This, this can't be the will of God for me to be sitting here like this. And you know the story. It was midnight. It was midnight. I've heard, it, I've heard it said that midnight is the darkest time of the night. Yeah. We used to joke, my wife and I, we would joke, and uh, we would be, in, when we were still living in Charleston, we had to drive by Women and Children's Hospital, and if we were out kind of late, we, we would drive by the hospital, and we'd joke about whether the emergency room was going to be full or not. And true, the closer it got to midnight, the fuller it was. The fuller the emergency room was. It, 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 was, it, it, it was like everybody waited till midnight to come out. I think there's some folks in here that's had some midnight hours. There's some folks in here that's had some midnight trials. When it seemed the darkest. I, I think there's some folks here, maybe, maybe even right now, maybe, maybe you're at a midnight time in, in your life. And, and let me tell you something, midnight matters. Midnight matters. Doesn't mean you're out of the will of God because you're going through a trial. Doesn't mean you're out of the will of God because sickness has come. Doesn't mean you're out of the will of God because you're, you're, you're facing uh, a time in your life that, that is difficult and hard and the circumstances aren't good. Paul and Silas had not rebelled against God. They were not living in sin. This was not the judgment of God upon them. And so often we think that. Where does that come from? We think that, oh, I'm in this trial. I must have done something really bad, God. What in the world did I do that was so bad? And, and, and I, I tell you, sometimes we make stuff up. We make stuff up just to, just to figure out why we're in that trial and, and why we're going through such a midnight time in our life. And, and we start, start conjuring all kinds of things in our minds and in our, in our imagination. They, they were just having a midnight experience in the will of God. In the will of God. It was midnight. Backs bruised, beaten, shackles on their hands and feet. And Paul looks over and to Silas and says, do you remember page 34 in the Old Testament hymnal? Do you remember page 34 uh, in the Old Testament songbook that says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That's page 34 of the Old Testament hymnal, Psalm 34, if you want to get technical. And, and I, I can imagine they, they look over and they, they, they think they're, they're talking about this and, and, and uh, beginning to, to say, you know, uh, may, maybe there's something to that. Maybe there's something to that, that praising the Lord at all times. You know, when I'm studying, a lot of times uh, I, I try to come, try to figure out, God, okay, now what is it, what is it in this lesson? What is it in this lesson I, that I really want to, I really want to give the church? I really want to, I really want to, I want something that I can, I can leave the church. I want something that they can hold on to. When, when they get up and they walk out of the church, when Sunday school's over and church is over and they go out into the world, I, I want to give them something that's going to help them every day. Uh, I want to give them something that's going to help them live, their, live a life uh, of, uh, worthy of serving God. I want to give them something that's going to give them strength through their midnight hours, through their midnight trials. And, and, and so, Lord, what, what is it that, God, I can give them? And, Paul said it when he, when he wrote it to the Philippians. And, and if you, you don't get anything else out of today, I, I, I want you to get what I'm talking about right now. If, you, if nothing else sinks in today, I, I want you to get a hold of this. Paul, when he was writing to the Philippian church, he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. 
again I say rejoice. If you get nothing else out of this, I want you to get it in your heart. I can bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall, count, shall continually be in, <coughs> in my mouth. That, that, that praise and rejoicing. See, Paul wrote this book to the Philippian church. But Paul learned this lesson when he first went to Philippi to preach the gospel. He learned about rejoicing in a prison cell. That's why he could write this in a prison cell. He learned about praising God at midnight. He learned about praising God when it's the darkest. He learned about praising God. Now all of us can praise God when everything's great. When there's no struggle. When there's no problems. All of us can. When it's easy to lift your hands up in an atmosphere when you're surrounded by other people that's praising God. But when you're set in that prison cell by yourself. When you're there and your back's beating. When you're there and you're bruised from the battle and from the struggle, and from the trial, I'm telling you, there, <coughs> there is something about praising God in the midnight hour. There is something that's powerful when you can worship God. I determined a long time ago, when I'm going through a trial, and I'm going through a test, I am not going to let the devil know he's getting to me. And you know how, he know, how the devil can know if he's getting to you? When, he, when your worship starts to dwindle. dwindle. When, when, when your worship starts to wither. When, 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 when you, you come to church when it's good and, and you're all, oh, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're singing Amazing Grace and you're, shout, and you're shouting to when we all get to heaven. But when you can stand there and praise God at midnight, the devil don't know what to do with you. When you can stand there and praise God when it's dark, when it's lonely, when it's troubled, when there's trials, you, the devil doesn't know how to handle you. He doesn't know how to deal with you because he, that's not the way it's supposed to be. But Paul said, I learned this in a prison. It's in my spiritual DNA. I know that there's trials. I know there's tests. But in the midst of it all, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Finally, my brethren, he said, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. It was almost like Paul was commanding them to rejoice no matter what. Paul was telling them rejoice no matter what. I'm telling you, if you get nothing else today, get this. Get this. Because this will get you through midnight. This will get you through midnight. This will get you through the test and the trial. You reach, I don't feel like rejoicing. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. He didn't say rejoice in your circumstances. He said rejoice in the Lord. In the Lord. He, God said, I am God and I change not. God doesn't change because you're having a bad day. God doesn't change because your circumstances are, are, are not good right now. God doesn't change because troubles are surrounding you. Paul said, I'm troubled on every side. I got you. I, I, I look this way, I got trouble. I look that way, I got trouble. I look that way, I got trouble. I try to back up, I back up into trouble. Sometimes you got trouble everywhere. But if you can rejoice, if you can rejoice in the Lord, 
You know, when Paul and Silas started singing and giving praises to God at midnight, the Bible says an earthquake shook that place. God sent an earthquake. Now, the only thing that earthquake was waiting on was somebody to praise. Somebody song. That earthquake was ready to go. But, God, but it wasn't going anywhere until somebody said, I, I may be beaten and I may be bound, but I'm going to praise God anyway. <clears throat> I can almost hear the rattle of those chains as Paul and Silas weakly would lift their hands up and start singing, Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. I will praise Him. I'll praise Him in the morning. I'll praise Him in the noontime. I'll praise Him at midnight. And an earthquake filled that came in there. Prison doors opened. Paul and Silas' prison door. But it didn't just open their prison door. It opened every prison door. I'm telling you, when you get into apostolic, there is power in apostolic praise. And you start giving apostolic praise. You start giving up. You start doing apostolic praise. And you start worshiping the Lord. There's something that's going to happen. Something's going to happen in the spirit. Something's going to happen in, in your spirit. You're gonna, it's going to lift you up. You're going to start praising God. And you know what? The Bible says that the jailer, the jailer got converted. And the jailer's family got converted because of two men that wouldn't let the prison take their praise away. Because of two men that said, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. And that's why Paul could write those words to the Philippian church. They knew their church had come, had been born in pain. They knew their church had been born in trial. That church existed because two men went to prison. They knew that. But they also knew what praise did. They were witnesses to what praise did when Paul and Silas started singing. So when, when Paul wrote those words, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. They were, they were looking back and they were saying, you know what? Paul is what he preaches. Paul is what he preaches. He does, doesn't sit down and write that rejoice in the Lord. But he's, he's done it. He's lived it. He knows what happened in a prison cell. He knows what happens at a midnight hour. He knows what happens when the trials are, are tough and you're surrounded with... <coughs> <coughs> with trouble on every side. He knows all about that. He understands all of that. And he knows when you start praising God. Oh, somebody needs to say hallelujah right now. Somebody needs to say hallelujah. I praise you, God. I worship you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Church, I'm, man, I'm, all, I'm skipping all over my notes. Rejoicing in the Lord means to find our joy in him. Not in your circumstance, but in him. In who he is. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord. Folks, this is not just a New Testament thing. This is not just an Old Testament thing. It's a God thing. It's a God thing to praise Him. It's a God thing to rejoice in the Lord. And I'm not just talking about rejoicing when you get a new car. I'm talking about rejoicing when you don't have a car. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about rejoicing when you, when you get a new job. I'm talking about rejoicing when you don't have a job. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Rejoicing in the Lord. Everybody knows about the fruit of the Spirit, right? Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Say it so I can hear you. Against such there is no law. Love is the first one. What's the second one? Joy. Fruit of the Spirit. Joy. That's why you can have, you're full of the Holy Ghost. 
You got the Holy Ghost in you. You got joy in you. You've been filled with the Spirit. You got love in you. And you got joy in you. And that joy, that joy is, is you, the fruit of the Spirit is, is what we need to make us like Jesus. To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. On earth I long to be like him. All through life's journey from earth to glory. I only ask to be like him, to be like Jesus. You want to be like Jesus? You got to be able to have some joy in your life. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. That joy that you get out of the Lord, it's what Christian character is made of. <clears throat> it's about living a, a victorious life, having joy in your life, being a victorious Christian. There, there's nothing more confusing to me than a Christian without joy. That confuses me. That because that 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 just that's an oxymoron. I'm not calling somebody moron. I said it's an oxymoron. It's the opposite. A Christian without joy. One of the fruit of the spirit, the second fruit of the spirit is joy. Once you get love, joy should be next. Joy should be at the top of the list of what, of what we get. Because rejoicing takes our focuses on the Lord, but rejoicing in the Lord focuses on the Lord and not on our circumstances. What are you saying, Brother Johnson? What are you saying? I, I, I'm saying that uh, you can go into the fiery furnace and you can still dance in the fiery furnace when you're, when you're in the middle of your trial and you can still offer up praise unto God in the middle of of a fiery furnace and the Lord will be right there with you in the midst of the fire when people get overwhelmed it, it's it's hard to rejoice in the Lord and to be overwhelmed by your circumstances at the same time now we are I, I I would venture to say, pastor included, that everybody in here has been overwhelmed by something at times. We all have. Because life can be overwhelming. Trials can be overwhelming. Responsibilities can be overwhelming. We've all been overwhelmed by things at all times. But it's hard to be overwhelmed by something if you are rejoicing in the Lord. Because one works against the other. Rejoicing in the Lord has nothing to do with your circumstances. It has everything to do with your God. It has everything to do with who God is. And when we rejoice, when people rejoice in the Lord, you, you, it, you can't, it's hard to be overwhelmed by your struggles and the things you're going through. Because rejoicing in the Lord is not merely, I'm not talking about offering up a couple words. I'm, I'm talking about rejoicing, making that effort to find your joy in the Lord, to make that effort to, 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 to understand the greatness of the God that you serve is greater than your circumstances, is greater than your struggles, is greater than your sickness, is greater than your problem, is greater than your midnight. And it's easy to rejoice in that kind of a God. A God that, that's with you every minute, that never leaves you, nor forsakes you. And Paul believed this so strongly that he ended up saying it three times in the book. He ended up, he ended up talking about three times, rejoice in the Lord always. And, and again, I say rejoice. And then he goes on, let your moderation be known unto all men. I, that's another Bible study, another time. We'll go on to that. But then he says, put verse 6 up, Philippians 4, 6. Then he says this, be careful for nothing. Don't worry. Uh-oh. I think I just hit a nerve. Don't worry. 
but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God Paul was instructing the church at Philippi and instructing us today be careful for nothing don't worry don't worry what's the remedy for worry in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God prayer was the answer then prayer is the answer now Let, let, let me tell you, let me tell you why this is so important. Have you ever noticed how l a little worry can cast such a big shadow? You ever notice that? Just a little worry can cast a really long shadow. And it can, that shadow can cover a whole lot of things. And in the shadow, things are harder to see than things that are in the light. And worry keeps us from living in the joy of the Lord. Worry keeps us from experiencing the peace of God because it distracts us. Everybody say a distraction. It distracts us from God's greatness. Worry, it doesn't change God. It doesn't change who God is. God is still almighty. He's still all powerful. We just don't see him that way. It distracts us. Worry distracts us from the greatness of God. But when we go to the Lord and we take our request to God and, and we, we, we come to the Lord with thanksgiving. Now there, there's a, there's a, a formula here that Paul's given us. There's a formula because because if we're going to live an overcoming and, and a, a delivered life now you can be saved and and still still have bondage the children of Israel came out of Egypt but it took years to get Egypt out of Israel they came out of Egypt but every time a trial came they started saying, why did you bring us out here to die? They went from 0 to 180 in one trial. Started saying, okay, well, let's, 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 go, back to, let's go back to Egypt. Because they started smelling the leeks and the onions and the garlic of Egypt. Started thinking about the good things of Egypt. Forgetting about the slavery bondage they just started thinking about about kind of like we do the food of Egypt and, and, and they sometimes you can you can be saved you can be you can have the Holy Ghost you can be baptized in Jesus name you you can talk in tongues you you can be have a repented life and you can still have an Egypt mindset have strongholds in your mind that, that's been built in your mind. And, and worry keeps us. Worry is one of those things that keeps us from living a delivered life. I'm glad God doesn't just save us, God delivers us. But he gives us a formula in, in verse 6. He said, in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. He talked about three different types of prayer there. Prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. 
Prayer is what your general prayer. Supplication is a more passionate prayer. It's a more desperate prayer before God. And thanksgiving is thanksgiving. So if, if, if you pray and, and you come before God and you're desperate and desperately seeking the Lord, and you, I'm sure you all prayed this way. There have been times in your life you've had situations you've desperately went before God about and, and uh, got down on your knees and, and wept and cried and, and, and uh, did all that, uh, taking whatever your burden was to the Lord and and. Asking God to intervene for your children or asking God to intervene for your family or, or for your situation, whatever it was. But you've got to add thanksgiving into that equation. And you add thanksgiving into that equation, you've got access to one of heaven's greatest treasures. And that's in verse 7 of chapter 4, of chapter four verse 7. And the peace of God. And the, that's one of heaven's greatest treasures, especially in the generation we live, when people have so little peace. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, doesn't even make sense. Doesn't make sense to have peace when you're sitting in a, in a jail cell in Philippi. It doesn't make sense to have peace when you're going through trial and tribulation. But it's not your peace. It's the peace of God. It's the peace of God. And that peace shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. God's peace. It's like God's peace is going to stand guard around your heart and is going to stand guard around your mind. And God's peace is going to defend your heart and your mind against worry, against trouble, against fear, against all those things that will perplex you. It's going to guard your heart and mind. I got to finish. We didn't even get through. Well, we made it through three verses. About as far as we made it. But God wants you to have peace. God wants you to have peace. I remember several years ago reading a story. And these people were trapped in an elevator. And that's one of those things I have hoped would never happen to me. Not that, not that I fear being trapped in an elevator. I just don't want to be in there with all those people for that long time. I don't know those people. So these people were trapped, and, and so the, the response, the response is probably a normal response. They started yelling, help, help, help. Some of them started pounding on the door, trying to make noise, trying to get somebody's attention. Nobody heard them. Nobody heard the pounding, nobody heard the yelling. There was one little boy in there, he's with his mother, one little boy, and he tugged on his, he's watching all this commotion going on, and he tugged, he tugged on his mom's skirt. He said, Mom, what's this? And he pointed over, and there on the, where the, all the buttons and everything were, there was a phone receiver. And she looked at her, the phone, she looked at him, and she picked up the phone, and she put it up to her ear. And someone said, is there a problem? And the woman said, yes, we're, we're trapped in an elevator between such and such floors and such and such a building, and we're trapped in the elevator. She said, the fire department's on the way. Hung up the phone. Those people had got caught up in, in responding to the trapped elevator that they forgot that the designer of the elevator made a way just for that circumstance. Do you realize God knew about your circumstance before it ever showed up? And before it ever showed up, God made a way 
God made a way. Before, it was already done. It was already done before you got up in that trial even said hello. It was already done before you, you even thought your first worrisome thought. God had already made a way. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Pray with all prayer and supplication and thanksgiving and the peace of God that passes all understanding and the peace of God that passes all understanding will stay guard over your hearts and over your minds. Stand with me. I got to quit. I got to quit. God said, God made a way. He made that way. That way is designed for you. He made it for you because he knew what you would go through. He knew the trials you would face. trouble you'd have. He knew that he knew you would sit in a doctor's office and you would hear a report. He knew that that job would situation. He knew about the money pro he knew about the, the home situation. He knew. And he said because of that I'm going to make a way that you still have peace. That you still have joy midst of it all. Lord, we pray right now. I thank you, God, for your promises and your word. I thank you, God, that you have given us. And Lord, you've made a way for us. And right now, I know in this congregation this Sunday morning, God, that there are people that are going through trials even today. That Lord, God, they're, they're not sure how things are going to turn out. They're, they're concerned about this and that. But God, you've made a way. And so, Lord, I pray right now. Lord, I come before you with prayer. I pray over every situation right now. I pray over every trial. I pray over every circumstance. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't you take it to God right now? Take your situation to God. God, oh, God, hallelujah.